So the uh, introductory case here is a 62-year-old woman who's brought to the emergency room after she fell down a flight of stairs. Prior to the fall, she was doing well and was a community ambulator without assistance. Intraoperatively, uh, it was noted that the implants are well fixed. So there's a picture of a fracture here. And um, it's important to note when dealing with any of these periprosthetic fractures, whether it's the femur or the tibia or the patella, that we take note of the bone quality, where the fracture is, and whether the implants are well fixed or loose. Here we're told in the question that the implants are well fixed. And uh, later on, we'll go through the classification system. But they're asking what the most appropriate treatment for this type of fracture is where the implant is uh, well fixed. And the um, answer that they want you to pick is open reduction on internal fixation with a distal femoral locking plate. And again, we'll go through um, the rationale behind treating these and what the most appropriate treatment uh, for each type of fracture is. But for here, they want you to pick distal femoral locking uh, plate, especially in someone who's likely to have osteopenic bone stock. So the categories of total knee periprosthetic fractures in general are distal femur, proximal tibia, and patella fractures. In terms of uh, timing, when we look at intraoperative versus postoperative fractures, the most common location for an intraoperative fracture is the medial femoral condyle. Uh, this is usually seen with a PS type prosthesis where there's a, a box and you often note when you're doing a total knee that the thinnest bone bridge is found medially. And so through this area uh, where there's a stress riser is the usual location of the fracture. So in general, the risk factors as you would expect would be poor bone quality, uh, things that lead to bone poor bone quality include age and stress shielding of the uh, bone. And there can be also things that compromise the quality of the bone, uh, such as screw holes, localized osteolysis that uh, Tom reviewed earlier in his presentation, uh, as well as a stiff knee. There are conditions also that are listed here that increase the likelihood of a patient suffering a periprosthetic fracture mostly due to instability in their gait, um, which could result in a fall. Here's another question on periprosthetic fractures. It asks which of the following is true regarding intraoperative fractures during total knee arthroplasty. And this is where um, that earlier uh, statement that the fractures of the medial femoral condyle, the most common type of fracture that occurs intraoperatively. The other uh, choices, are less likely to be true. A cruciate retaining total knee does not use a, a so-called box cut, so the stress riser uh, is not as uh, prevalent. In terms of fractures of the patella, they do happen, but not as frequently as fractures of the, um, of the femur, uh, uh, and that is why choice number two is correct here. In terms of distal femur periprosthetic fractures, they occur rarely, but uh, they do occur. It's debatable in the literature whether anterior femoral notching uh, can result in an increased incidence of fracture. Certainly, um, a larger notch, as, as seen on the radiographic here, may predispose a patient with poor bone quality uh, to a fracture. In addition, uh, behind the metal implant, there's often stress uh, shielding, and there's a mismatch in the uh, modulus of elasticity between the implant bone composite and the uh, bone at the uh, junction of the implant, uh, which uh, can increase the stress in that area and uh, make that area susceptible uh, to a fracture. In terms of the, uh, the uh, uh, classification, there are a number listed on OrthoBullet's uh, uh, website. Uh, here, I've simplified it to the soup uh, classification, which is used in the remainder of this uh, section. Um, one of the um, areas that's not really addressed by this classification is the fixation status of the implant. So again, we need to look at bone quality, the location of where the fracture is, and whether the implant is well fixed or not. So a SU type 1 would be where the fracture is proximal to the femoral component, a SU type Two is where the fracture originates at the proximal aspect of the femoral component and then extends more proximally. 
and a SU type 3 would be where any part of the fracture line is distal to the upper edge of the anterior flange of the femoral component. Again, femoral uh, component fixation is important to note um, when deciding what the appropriate treatment is for any of these uh, SU uh, types. So in terms of treatment for these distal femur fractures, uh, non-operative treatment is appropriate for non-displaced fractures with a stable prosthesis. And you'll find that this theme is uh, pretty much consistent through periprosthetic fractures of the tibia and uh, patella as well. In terms of uh, uh, the treatment options, an anti-grade intramedullary nail would be appropriate for a SU type 1 fracture, which is a fracture that originates above the level of the anterior flange. A retrograde intramedullary nail is a nice way to treat a SU type 1 or type 2 fractures, but a prerequisite is that uh, the prosthesis has an open box design that's able to accommodate a nail. Uh, so it's useful to know what type of implant is in there when performing your preoperative uh, planning to see if not only is the box large enough, but in an appropriate position where a retrograde nail can be passed. The uh, fixation with a fixed angle device has become uh, more uh, popular, uh, especially with the SU type 3 fractures. These locking plates can provide great fixation, actually, in osteoporotic bone, where other forms of fixation, uh, such as non locking plates, uh, have not been uh, as successful. When considering using a plate, it's important to, to note that the technique can influence the outcome significantly. Uh, in terms of the risk of non-union, uh, there is an increased risk when plating uh, via an extensile lateral approach due to the soft tissue stripping uh, that can occur. Conversely, when um, using a minimally invasive technique, the MIPO here stands for Minimally Invasive Plate Osteosynthesis, there is an increased risk uh, for malunion, uh, perhaps uh, because of inadequate reduction of the, uh, of the fracture. Revision to a long stem prosthesis is always a tra an attractive option, especially for a patient that's relatively younger. Oftentimes, however, uh, the bone is osteoporotic uh, and difficult uh, to uh, keep in intact uh, when trying to uh, preserve the bone and using a long stem prosthesis. Um, in, uh, in many of our uh, experiences, um, these fractures occur in people with poor bone. Uh, who are elderly, uh, and um, uh, oftentimes uh, when the prosthesis is loose or the bone stock is of extremely poor quality in an elderly patient, a distal femoral replacement can be uh, quite useful in order to get the patient uh, moving. Uh, however, a disadvantage of these uh, type of implants is that they can lead to loosening, especially in patients who are relatively young uh, or uh, active. So while they do have their advantages. They should be used selectively in an appropriate patient uh, population. Here's a, uh, a question regarding a 65-year-old female who sustained a periprosthetic supracondylar femur fracture proximal to a well-fixed implant. So that's an important piece of information. The implant is well fixed. She then undergoes direct reduction and lock plating with a distal femoral locking plate via an extensile lateral approach. They're including that in the question because it's very uh, important in terms of determining what the um, right answer is. At nine months postoperatively, uh, with the patient's weight bearing at 50%, it's still painful for the patient. They perform an appropriate workup for infection. Infection should always appear in the differential uh, diagnosis, especially on uh, tests. So the ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, and C-reactive protein were normal, and radiographs were taken nine months postoperatively that are shown here. And clearly, this fracture hasn't uh, healed. So the appropriate answer uh, to this question is um, the extensile lateral approach that uh, uh, most likely involves more stripping of the soft tissue and therefore uh, a reduction in the blood supply to the uh, bone uh, resulted in an increased uh, risk of the uh, non-union that, non that occurred.
moving on to tibial periprosthetic fractures, uh, the incidence is uh, still quite low, uh, but these can be devastating complications. Fracture specific risk factors include component loosening um, and associated uh, osteolysis or component malpositioning and insertion of long stem tibial components can be a risk factor as the preparation of the uh, bone uh, via reaming process or uh, if incomplete cement removal uh, occurs, uh, the reaming uh, can be directed outside of the tibial shaft and result in a uh, periprosthetic fracture of the uh, tibia. This is the Felix classification. A type 1 fracture would be a fracture of the tibial uh, plateau. A type 2 fracture is a fracture adjacent to the tibial stem but proximal to the end of the uh, component. Type 3 is a fracture of the tibial shaft distal to the component and a type 4 is a fracture of the tibial uh, tubercle. Once again, when considering periprosthetic fractures, one has to take note of the bone quality, the location of the fracture, and the stability of the implant uh, when making a decision as to treatment. So non-operative treatment would be appropriate for a patient who has a non-displaced fracture with a prosthesis that is well fixed. Open reduction internal fixation is appropriate uh, for patients with an unstable fracture pattern, but for whom the prosthesis is stable and not loose. A long stem revision prosthesis is appropriate if the component has come loose and the fracture is displaced. Here's a, a question of a 73-year-old woman who underwent a left knee revision nine months ago. She states she's been unable to extend her knee since she fell six months ago. So this has turned into a chronic problem for this patient. Treatment should consist of one, which of the following? So here is the, uh, the radiograph. They give you a, a lateral radiograph that shows the patella in an extreme alta position. But there is also a remnant of the patella or of the cement uh, mantle uh, still left around the femoral uh, condyle in the trochlear groove. So they're asking, what's the most appropriate treatment uh, for this uh, type of injury? And they're hinting towards the fact that this is a chronic problem uh, for which a, a repair of the extensor mechanism is unlikely uh, to work, and this patient will most likely require an extensor mechanism allograft. Uh, when going through the choices here, a knee fusion is probably uh, quite a, an aggressive uh, choice uh, for this uh, type of problem and uh, uh, unlikely uh, to be the, the answer here, and, and no one picked that uh, choice. In terms of patelectomy with primary repair, again, this is more of a chronic uh, issue, and um, a repair after a patelectomy would be uh, probably uh, very, very unsuccessful. Open reduction internal fixation with the chronicity of the injury also unlikely to be successful, and certainly cast immobilization and full extension um, is unlikely to uh, solve the patient's problem. So um, this is a fairly easy one to pick out the right uh, answer as 100% of the, the crowd did. Looking at peri uh, patella periprosthetic fractures, thankfully these are quite rare. I think the incidence is uh, closer to 0.2% rather than 21%. Uh, it is higher However, in resurfaced uh, patella, uh, which makes sense because when you perform the patella resection, you thin the patella out and you uh, usually drill holes in it. Uh, if the patella uh, has gone on to become osteonecrotic uh, or is overly thin or you use a central large peg implant, these are things that are classically considered to increase the, uh, the risk of uh, patella uh, fracture and commonly occur on tests. The, uh, per, the uh, per, patella periprosthetic fractures are classified according to the Goldberg classification. A type 1 is a fracture not involving the, the implant or the quadriceps. A type 2 is a fracture involving the implant or the quadriceps. A type 3 um, involves the uh, patella ligament. And a type 4 involves um, any fracture dislocation. In terms of treatment, the best outcomes are, are going to occur if you can treat these non-operatively. It's, it's appropriate to treat uh, in a, um, a periprosthetic fracture of the patella uh, 
uh, non-operatively if the implant is stable and the extensor mechanism is intact. Once again, I want to reiterate, when you see questions like this on a test, you have to know a couple of things. One, is the implant stable? And two, is the extensor mechanism intact? This type of um, treatment is the most successful uh, when used in uh, appropriate uh, patients. Operative treatment of these injuries uh, is fraught with uh, complications and, and poor uh, outcomes, as we saw from uh, uh, the largest series out of the uh, Mayo Clinic. So an operative indication would be if the uh, patella component were loose or there's an extensor mechanism disruption. There are a variety of techniques, uh, all of which are associated with a higher complication rate, um, but if the extensor mechanism is disrupted or the patella component is loose, we're often forced to offer uh, patients an operative um, intervention, but preoperative counseling is uh, key here. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.